Ah, yes, friends, on a victory Monday, it is OGP, One Giant Podcast, where I'm your host, Adam Armbrecht, covering the Giants and the Brooklyn Nets for the Locked On Nets podcast, joined by the co-host, the, the host and host. We're the same level of host. There's no hierarchy here. The healthy, wealthy, and wise, generational, season ticket holding, celebratory, Mr. Andrew Mackowitz. How are we, sir? How does it feel that the NFL season finally started maybe four weeks after we thought it was going to. It just, it just feels differently. And, and you know, what's funny, Adam is like on, on the days where the giants lose on a Sunday, you wake up Monday, the hangover hits a little bit more. You feel like, Oh, I should really exercise or I should work out. Like I, I, I got to get all these toxins out of me. When the giants win, you wake up in the morning, easy to roll out of bed. My friend, you say two, three, Five slabs of bacon. Let's spread it on at breakfast, right? I'm doing the hungry man at the at the at the breakfast it, table. It's it's like the wedding crashers uh, scene where he's like topping. just p- p- t- topping, topping everything with syrup on top because you're just feeling good about life. So that's that's how I felt this morning. No, listen, it was obviously don't bury the lead. A 27 21 uh, victory for the New York Football Giants in overtime on the road. Uh, at the Saints, obviously, they were coming back their first home game of the season with everything that's gone on down in New Orleans. So it, it was a lot of things about this were stacked against the uh, New York football giants, including Sean Payton's record in October, including Joe Judge's record in October. Like none of the statistics said that the Giants should have been really able to stay in this game. They were big underdogs in it. And yet starting we'll start at the end where it all began. 21 10. The Giants are down seven minutes to go in the fourth quarter. They punt the ball away. We'll get into that a little bit later, maybe just from the philosophical standpoint. But they punt the ball away, and this is where Joe Judge looks to Patrick Graham and says, you got to go out there and make a play for us here so we can get the ball back and still give ourselves an opportunity. I mean, really, man, every single domino fell in the right order for them. A touchdown, a two-point conversion, the field goal, and then on into overtime, where, as we know, Jabril Peppers with a little bit of Pepper, I guess I'll say, on, on his reaction to winning the coin toss. And it's just, we'll take the ball. And in today's NFL, and the way the Giants looked at the end of this game offensively, you thought, we get the ball nice and consistent down the field. Let's go get this win. I mean, it, that's about as good a football that we saw from the seven-minute mark in the fourth quarter through the overtime that we've gotten from the Giants in, in what feels like forever. Yeah. And and you bring up the 21 10 pivotal moment right around, you know, just right around midfield, the giants decide to punt the ball away. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you were, if you were like us and you follow Giants social media and giants, Twitter, uh, it set the world. Oh, it it got really bad. I mean, every, from some of the most well-respected beat writers to the passionate fans that love to engage with us at OGP, everyone basically said, Punting the ball is punting the season, and this is an abject failure. It's a disaster. Tear it down to the studs. It's over with. And I think, you know, listen, any any rational Giants fan looked at it and said, we've only put up 10 points. We need to do more than double that, and we're punting the ball away at midfield. It did feel like maybe the Giants were kind of waving the white flag at that point, saying, I don't know, the Saints get one, maybe two more first downs can slowly start to salt the way the game, but give credit where credit's due. You know, the Giants say that they they recognize that they could stop Jameis Winston. They said the defense can come up big and make a play, and they did. And I think the Giants also recognized that they were close a few times on offense and saw that Daniel Jones was, was, was pretty good, and they were just saying, can we get him the ball back as quickly as possible? And that's what they did. Yeah, listen, we, we talked about pre about maybe getting into this piece of it. I'm going to I'm going to side. I'm just going to sidebar this quickly because we'll probably cover way more of the big plays and a lot of the players here and, and what it means going forward, potentially for the New York football giants. But I'll just say, like, I, I know the way the way the Twitter reacted, not always the best barometer, but the, the post game comments from Joe Judge yesterday sounded exactly like he sounded after every single game this season. And what I mean by that is, is he wasn't wasn't getting too low about what was going on and it didn't feel good to hear him say listen we're working on it some things to clean up we want to get better some things that we like some things that we didn't like that's what he said for three straight games after losing and we were we, we dipped our toes into those waters of real frustration cut two you win a game what does he say after it yeah heck of a football team over there did some really good things i thought we we made some nice progress defense stepped up got the win like he's not getting too high or too low throughout this process and it's something worth remembering and 
the other comment was, uh, you know, people say being aggressive is going for it. And then listen, you can take it for whatever it wants. He said, listen, this is our version of being aggressive. Being aggressive is punting the ball away and saying my defense is going to go be aggressive, get us a stop, get the ball back. So listen, it, it plays out and it works. And that's why, and that's why you can say that afterwards, right? When you, when you lose the games, you know, when, and by the way, though, well, I'm not, let's, let's, let's stay on track here. We'll, we'll, it, we'll, we'll back, we'll go backwards in a little bit. Yeah. Let's stay focused on the, this game and some of the big playmakers that got them there. Listen, the, you know, history has, is written by the victors, right? Isn't that pretty much how it goes? So when, when Joe judge comes out there at the press conference and puffs his chest out and says, that's what, uh, us go being ultra aggressive is all about. And if, you know, the saints pick up two first downs, it's the complete polar opposite. So like, yes, he, he can have a victory lap because his decision-making worked out, uh, you know, uh, now it's not a time to be critical of Joe Judge when the Giants get a win. I would have liked him to see them be a little bit more aggressive earlier in the game with some of the different choices that they had, but that's neither here nor there because the Giants ended up getting getting the W at the end of the day. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't puff. It wasn't chest puffing to me because again, he wasn't arrogant about it. He sounded exactly like he sounded all throughout the start of this season, and you didn't like it when they were losing. And now people, you know, it's like you you want to like it when they're winning, or you want to say, ah, eh, fine, have your victory. Just listen, he was doing what he's doing, and to that point. Like you said, now, do you want to be having more than 10 points with seven minutes to go in the fourth quarter? Of course you do, right? But I think that there was this sense of, and you saw this early and throughout, and maybe the payoff finally came there, right? So there's a couple little things that lead up to this. The, the Saquon Barkley, who had at one point 10 rushes for 38 yards before he added on a little bit and got himself a respectable day um but by the end of it all but 10 for 38 told me something different than what we've seen early in the season he was averaging outside of a couple big runs 1.2 yards per carry so in this game he was getting those few yards with consistency right staying ahead of the chains as we like to say then when it comes down the stretch you end up having something you didn't see all game long an explosive wheel route up the sideline where he gets that ball in his hands and looks like the Saquon Barkley of old getting the job done getting into the end zone. Daniel Jones, little scamper, two-point conversion, right? Like, this was where the infancy of what we were hoping this offense could start to look like, all of a sudden it was like bang, bang, bang. It just, it all came together over what, you know, a 12, 13-minute stretch of time, of game time from the fourth quarter into overtime. Well, well listen, we, we talked about Saquon Barkley. I think every Giant fan is like, Thank goodness he looked pretty good. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, you needed it. You needed well, it. Well, 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 I'm going to get to Jason Garrett in a second because I think we we definitely need to talk about Jason Garrett. But we, we talked about burying the lead. We need to start every conversation with Daniel Jones. It has to be today because, you know, he, he ends up with 402 passing yards. He has two touchdowns. And he has one interception, which the interception was a Hail Mary at the end of the half that uh, I don't know how they could change the records in the record book, but that should never count against the quarterback for chucking one up. Didn't quite get but, there either. Quite get there I know it's just short too. It's almost like just throw it away at that point. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> but, but uh, I think it's noteworthy to note that this is the first time that Daniel Jones has had a completion percentage above 70% since week 10 of last year. So not only was he throwing for a crazy amount of yards, he was also deadly accurate, and you saw it on full display with the pass to John Ross. I mean, that 52-yard yeah. dime was exactly what the Giants needed, and it, it takes a speedster like John Ross, like you know, Joe Judge is like, we're not, we're not, we're taking, you know, him and Kadarius Tony are full goes, and you just see John Ross beeline it down the field, 52-yard peach. By Daniel Jones. And, and by the way, on that play, it's like this is a learning curve, probably for you know, a new receiver, new quarterback. Jones underthrew him. Like, I think Jones could have put it out there in front of him more. John Ross slows down to bring that ball in. Like, he he is toasting them, and then he's like, oh, oh, oh okay, I'll, I'll grab that, and it's why maybe the almost could have been a fumble, stays well, as a touchdown, all that good stuff. Look, but it was look like, what happens Look at what happens with the Slayton play, where he throws a little too far, far away <laughs> against Washington, and he can't catch the, the ball. At this, at least this one, he gave, he gave his wide receiver a chance to make the catch. But this is the point, Adam, is that, is that you can see it every single time. This is not giant fans having rose colored glasses. Daniel Jones can stretch the field vertically and he throws a beautiful deep ball. I will argue with anyone that wants to have this argument. He has a top 10 deep ball in the league for sure. I think it's actually higher than that. But if anyone wants to challenge that, they can go right ahead and watch the tape because 
Those are the types of throws he can make. You, you saw the wheel route out to, to Saquon Barkley that you mentioned before, perfectly in stride. And when you get, we get Saquon in space like that, like, you know, no one's catching him. He's too athletic to be able to be caught, but we got to start with Daniel Jones. It looked the part had an over, uh, you know, a hundred uh, passer rating, uh, a pretty high QBR. He, he looked great. You know, that one interception is going to bring it down. But is there any doubt that, like, he is the guy that we need to have moving forward? Yeah, I mean, listen, 67 completion percentage on the season now, a very strong performance. This is, And by the way, though, remember, the New Orleans Saints defense, guys up front that you got to worry about, worry about the offensive line protecting Daniel Jones. Their secondary has been gettable this season, right? They do have holes in it. And that's not to take away from the performance. What it means is when you walk onto the field and you know, that this is the weakness of a defense, you have to be able to attack it. You have to be able to expose it. 400 yards, that, that's how you do it, right? That is the quarterback understanding that I have real opportunities to make plays here and to put my team in a great position to win the game. So, I mean, listen, this is a continuing check mark for Daniel Jones as we work our way through the season. And every big game that he plays well in is another opportunity for us to feel like this is cementing the franchise quarterback, something that you and I have been optimistic about, have certainly wavered on here here and there over the over his career but for the most part we we've been on this course of i think he can get there and this is that idea of staying the course and not swinging the pendulum too hard inside of this game i will say you got to look at a couple of things you mentioned this to me in text message after the game was over about kenny galladay and his big performance i'm going to go to him first Kadarius tony was phenomenal. There's a number of plays to talk about. There's the there's a number of Mia Copas on why you draft a player like this. We hadn't had a chance to really see him. Now we have. And now our eyes are fully open on him. But Kenny Galladay in this game, um, you know, there was the third and seven play where he gets met at the point of reception for about an eight, eight yard gain and just kind of bumps off the defender and then scoots for another 15. He had the wide open play where he and Kadarius Tony run the crossing routes to get the giants down inside the five, like all these big plays. I think that in that regard, Kenny Galladay is a bit of a throwback NFL wide receiver, right? He's big. He's physical. He doesn't create a lot of separation, but guess what he does do catches that football gets you those tough yards afterwards and, and we'll get to Kadarius Tony. But this is the this is the dynamic that you see getting set up here, right? These two very different stylized players that you can use in really explosive ways because you have both of them on the field. Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, we were talking in text, and and obviously we were all excited to see our first round pick get out there in Kadarius Tony. But the the first name that pops into my head was Kenny Galladay. I mean, Adam. He was the guy that did the dirty work. Like, that's what I kind of felt like he did out there. You know, you have Kadarius Tony on some of these different gadget plays, human joystick type plays where he's moving and, and, and shaking and picking up extra yards. But Kenny Galladay is the guy that goes over the middle in traffic and is willing to take a hit and keep on going. You know, that, that big pickup that he had late in the fourth quarter on that third down where he breaks through and gets us 25 yards, that is the type of play. That, that's why you pay someone big money is mm -hmm. to be able to make those catches. And for all, you know, for the burner and, and good work John Ross did, for the amazing plays that Kadarius Tony did, Pro Football Focus came out and, and had Kenny Galladay the highest-ranked uh, graded wide receiver for the Giants. And it's because he just made all of those tough catches. Well, it's, all con it's contested, a lot of contested work, right? right. That's where you're right. going to see the, the, the value is in. When you weren't wide open, when you had a player on you, you're still making those receptions and converting for first down. That That's obviously a big part of it as well. Yeah, and, and to me, this is just like, this is why we got Kadarius Tony. You need a big play, you know, big-bodied wide receiver that Daniel Jones can go to. When the going gets tough and it's third and eight, we want to get a guy over the middle for 10 yards. And Galladay can be the guy that can catch it for six and drag two uh, defensive players with him. But... But I think I, I know you want to get to this because I, I think it's pretty exciting for Giant fans. Let, let's let's talk a little bit about Kadarius, Tony. I mean, well, I mean listen, I, I do think one of the things that helps in terms of putting Kenny Galladay in good position to be able to be aggressive and be that powerful wide receiver is the fact that over the course of this game, you started to see in a different way. Go back to the earlier games of the season, Kenny Galladay nursing a little bit of an injury. So hard to go one to one. Sterling Shepard, very effective out of the slot. But this is a different level of dynamic playmaker. Third and 18, they get it to Kadarius Tony, three yards past the line of scrimmage. And he juke, scoots, 
dodges, pushes through. Like, you know, th- there's a couple of that one play right there. What I love about it is the Giants haven't converted a third and 18 in 65 years. You know what I mean? They, they don't they don't make those plays. Kadarius Tony is able to do it. He's able to make players miss. But even beyond that, though, at the end of that play, he moves through one or two defenders to fall forward for that yardage. The one thing I'll say for Kadarius Tony, man, is he's a small receiver, but he's thick. Like he does not look like a, like a rail thin and not, this isn't a knock on him, but Devonte Smith, right in the draft, you talk about who you want to go for here, a playmaker guy with speed. Kadarius Tony looks like he can play physical and that's a much different type of weapon. When you know, you can not only get him the ball in space and let him use his natural athleticism and speed and all those gifts, but also physical enough to go make plays in traffic, to work against the defense and really get them back on their heels. I thought so much of his six catches on nine targets for 78 yards really was about just getting the Saints kind of stepping back a little bit and saying, okay, okay, hey, now we got to worry here. We need to have, they mentioned on the broadcast, Jenkins, every time that ball went to Tony, Jenkins was coming right out of his safety spot and saying, I need to fly to this and try to mitigate what the yak is going to be on these plays. And it was very difficult to do. This is now an entirely new layer of weapon for the Giants. And I'm not saying that this is the comparable, but this is ultimately where the Giants want to get to. You look at Tyree Kill being that at, like guy where you get the ball to him in space. It doesn't matter if it's 50 yards down the field or five yards behind the line. When he has the ball in his hand, it's electric. And when you think about Kenny Galladay, he's that guy that will get you the grunt work, the tough yards. He, it, It's like the Tyree Kill and Travis Kelsey comparable. And then you have a guy like Hardman or whoever on the outside, which is the John Ross of this team that can burn down the field and, and get you the big plays. That's ultimately what the Giants are modeling it this after. We only hope that it can it can end up being the, the way that it is in Kansas City, but it, we, we could see the model works. Like the reason why Kelsey gets some of those yards is because Tyree can stretch the defense, either make them come up and try to get him immediately or back them off when he goes deep. Now, by the way, and, and it's funny because these aren't one-to-ones, right? But when you go back to last season, it's Sterling Shepard in theory, injuries obviously, but it's Sterling Shepard and it's Darius Slayton. The one-to-one now is, from Darius Slayton to Kenny Galladay, you know, and from Sterling Shepard to Kadarius Tony. These aren't, this isn't, you know, it is the ultimate replacement pieces in a lot of ways, but you just, you see the different level that each of these receivers has, right? Different skill sets from Slayton to Galladay. We, we get that, but, could, you know, Tony is another level of athleticism, even beyond Sterling Shepard. And it has to also get you excited, just briefly looking forward of saying, What's the world when Shepard is healthy and now you've got two very quick, twitchy, quick in tight space receivers with Kenny Galladay on the outside, with Slayton, with John Ross, right? Now you think about all the different dynamic positions you can put all of these playmakers in where the defense on a down and distance isn't going to know. Who's the ideal? Who's the number one read here? It could be any number of at least the top three in Galladay, Shepard, and Tony. And then can Darius Slayton be successful on the back end off of that or John Ross, whoever you're going to plug in there? It's just opportunities are going to be created. And, uh, and, and no, Evan Ingram won't be involved in that. Well, it, it's you, you, uh, you omitted something when, when we talk about the three wide receiver sets from last year, it was Golden, T- Golden Tate. Sterling sure. Shepard and Darius Slayton. And now when you have Kenny Galladay, Kadarius Tony, and John Ross, you can see the different dynamics that, that it actually brings to the table. You like I look at I look at those three players this year and I say each one of them has a unique skill set that is I, I I don't know if I'd say elite, but it's definitely upper echelon in the league. Kenny Galladay can get contested balls. Well, oh, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you right now, Kadarius Tony, Kadarius Tony is uh, the two things at least in this sample size whether or not the giants ever used him this way like they were supposed to but we haven't really seen it over his whole career Kadarius tony is what they thought odell beckham jr was going to be or how they thought they were going to use him as in this gadget all over the field kind of player obj phenomenal talent but also maybe just a bit more of a pure receiver right because he isn't necessarily thick or tough enough to handle some of those other plays where you want to work him in space and take some big hits but Kadarius Tony is that is going to be the number one wide receiver on this team wow like th- that he is going to be the number one and Kenny Galladay is going to feast as an elite as we've always said right when they went and signed him was he the elite of the elite is he Devonte Adams no he's not doesn't mean he can't be exceptional for us 
But I think that Kadarius Tony just gave us this, this nice little sample size to say, I can be wreaking so much havoc on a defense that all of a sudden players are going to be feasting around me because an extra set of eyes is always going to be on where is this player? What is he doing? And not unlike OBJ, it's the same thing the Giants thought they were going to have in Evan Ingram. This mismatch, difficult to guard. Every defense has to look and see where he is. I think the Giants finally have that. And it's, to some extent, a, a, a mea copa on, on my end, at least, of we, we've gone back and forth, right? Was the real value there? Should you have gone for him? Yesterday's game is a heck of a sample size to say that Kadarius Tony is going to be one of the more dynamic receivers in this league going forward in his career. Well, it, a game like this is one where Joe Judge, like I said, can take a victory lap. Yep. Gettleman can take his small victory lap and say, like, this is why we got this guy. And, and Joe Judge can say, this is why I stay patient on offense yeah, and patient. Gotta go do it again, right? <laughs> right, right. Like I'd like to see it more than once because yeah. if you're doing it one out of every four times, that's probably not going to be too good because you're one and three. But Adam, I I've got I've got a stat that can go either way, and I want you to tell me which way you'd like to take it. The shocking thing about this is in this game, there was zero sacks by both teams. Mm -hmm. So the Giants didn't get any sacks, but the Giants offensive line did not give up any sacks which way would you like to go with this one well listen so we we can we can expand a little bit beyond it right that this is all the positive the giants get a win we can think about how they could have won either of week two or week three right so we're one and three but maybe we're a team that's playing more like a two and two kind of club right and we can feel good about that the other side of it is i'll, I'll get to the giants offensive side because let's focus on one piece of this year the giants were down 21 to 10 in the fourth quarter now in today's nfl 21 points it's not terrible defensively however talk about the little plays on either side of the ball and how it you know it can write the game script for you pretty quickly sean payton after just having hit a massive deep ball from Jameis winston on the very next series comes back he goes ahead and he pulls Winston out and he puts in Taysom Hill and Taysom Hill goes the distance. But guess what? He's Taysom Hill and he just kind of lobs this thing out there. And James Bradbury comes down with a very gettable pick and he came down with it. Right. We talk about make the big plays. We have the chance. He did it. But I watch James Bradbury with consistency on the outside, single man coverage, get his hips turned to the outside try to spin himself around and find himself about five to seven yards behind the wide receiver. Like there were consistent issues there on the back end of this defense, along with the safeties. And when you talk about no sacks, this is where there's a balance here to me because late, late in the game, you saw a couple of instances where the giants did get through and were starting to get pressure. What happened? Winston rolled out, found, found the nice little check down play for 10 to 15 yards. The interesting thing here is when the Giants aren't getting home defensively, you say they, they got to get sacks. You got to get pressures. You got to force the ball so you can make plays. But so far this year, when the Giants have gotten pressure, the back end of the defense hasn't been able to do its job of breaking up those pass plays. They had a handful of them in this one. The defense played better overall, but they haven't been able to. That rollout and check down play, that was on a Dory Jackson coverage, right? So we just haven't seen what we thought were going to be top 10, top 12 cornerback play on both sides, we're getting top 20 play. And, and that's the difference, I think, about being able to shut down a lot of these drives versus Jameis Winston, another high completion quarterback performance. Now, you only, you know, threw in the 220s, 230s, but the yardage was there, ran for 170. So, you know, teams are still having success. I think it's just a new philosophy about last year, we were shutting down the run and trying to survive the pass. Now we're keeping the pass in front of us and kind of saying, yeah, we'll take the slow bleed through the run game here because we're not we're not quite set yet on that side of the ball. So the first uh, side note, and this is why stats can be so misleading, is that Jameis Winston had a higher passer rating and QBR than Daniel Jones did. Sure. And when you think about that, it's like anyone that watched that game for more than five minutes knew that Daniel Jones was the better was the better quarterback in that game. So that's we'll, we'll park that one to the side. It is interesting because because it felt like the, our our cornerback play and our secondary play wasn't great. Yet James Bradbury, Logan Ryan, and Radarius Williams had 69 or above Pro Football Focus grades, so they actually graded out pretty well. I mean, it certainly helps when uh, you know a deep bomb by Jameis Winston gets called back and uh, they decide to have 
Taysom Hill, as you mentioned, inexplicably, inexplicably throw one to, to James Bradbury, which will certainly help boost those numbers. You know, for me, I, I, I think that Aaron Rodgers when he let that go, by the way, he was like, <laughs> Aaron Rodgers, Rainmaker. <laughs> I mean, you're right. It is the Taysom Hill thing is so strange. It's such a strange hill to die on. It's like, yeah, it clearly works around the end zone where you can have him like run the ball. Guys. Yeah. yeah, and like, like he's he's a beast when it does that. Like, I you're trying to keep the defense honest, but it's like honest for what? Like, he clearly is not a good quarterback. He's a good gadget wildcat player. He's not a good quarterback. Like, note to self: do not put that in the playbook when Taysom Hill is there. He should not be throwing forty yard passes anymore right it just very and very quickly um the giants defensively i thought did a good job in coverage in front of them it was the deep stuff unlike weeks prior where you know safeties were to be found so i think they struggled down the field everything in front of them some things across the middle good pass breakups throughout this game so that's why i think you see overall solid grades quick quick little footnote though remember Kadarius tony had an opportunity to throw a pass here a lot of people talked about him and his background I, a very smart play by him they ran the gadget he rolled out he assessed it and then just ran for a yard. Like that was another just great little sample size where the kid was like, you know what I'd love to do is grip it and rip it. Taysom Hill style. But instead, no one's there. Let's just go ahead. You know, so again, just smart plays from this team. Continue. Yes. So uh, I, I don't want to talk about the negatives too much because this is a very positive week for us. Uh, I will say it, it was one. It was, I know it was glaring to not have Blake Martinez in the center of, of that linebacking core. You know, you had Tay Crowder, you had, you had Reggie Ragland. They tried their best to, to be 60 cents on the dollar of Blake Martinez. It, 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 it was like, you know, the only thing you lose. And I think, and I'm not, I'm not diminishing it. The only thing you're losing is sure tackling. Like, I don't think the, the drop off as far as play overall is that big, but the get into those holes and wrap up the running back, right? Having Blake Martinez meet Kamara in the hole as opposed to Tay Crowder. Sometimes you're asking Tay Crowder to do something very different. Right? Raglan gets his nose in there. He's big. He can be successful. But it's a lot to ask of Tay Crowder to also be there and run support. So, yes, but to your point, I thought they did an admirable job of filling in a gap when you have a signal caller, leader, captain of that defense who's not on the field. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, you know, he brings much more than, than, than his athleticism. That's not his calling card. It's, it's all the other things around it. And, and, you know, I think when, when you have those guys in there, then it impacts the pass rushers, it impacts the front three. There's a whole host of, of trickle effect that happens. But in terms of the positives, two things come to mind. One is that offensive line did not give up a sack. And for as uh, the sky is falling. This is going to be horrible. What are we going to do? We're pulling guys off the street. Guys are retiring in training camp. You know, the offensive line is just holding up. Like, it, it clearly isn't working very well on run protection. Uh, like, you, you can tell there's literally no holes for Saquon Barkley to really navigate through. It doesn't help that he's doing his little song and dance in the backfield sometimes, as opposed to just trying to run downhill. But on the pass, pass blocking and pass, def you know, pass protection, they've looked great. And, and let's continue to give our flowers to Andrew Thomas, who is Don't clearly looking what? Don't say flowers. Well, that's, it, that's the tongue in cheek is everyone said he's going to be Eric flowers. And instead we are giving the flowers to, to, to Andrew Thomas. He looked awesome. And I mean, he had another pro football focus grade in the high eighties, which is unbelievable. Um, I, I don't know. Did you have an, any initial thoughts about the offensive line? No, listen, I, I think you, you get you get Skur in there, left guard now, another new body in there with Bredesen dealing with his hand injury. So the rotating cast continues. I, I think there's obviously been a philosophical shift from last year to this year, regardless of the injuries of saying last year, we were much more conservative with what we were asking Daniel Jones to do and what we put on his plate this year. We're flipping it and we're saying. If we're going to win games and unfortunately, you know, sample size is, is not quite where we want it to be, but if we're going to win games, we're going to need to pass. We're going to need to be explosive in that regard. So we're focusing on the pass protection and giving Daniel Jones time. Is the run game suffering in that a little bit? Yeah, it is, but that's, that's the way it's going to be. I, I listen, man, when you lose Nick Gates and you're shuffling players around when Matt Pert doesn't look like he's going to be the player, at least yet for the giants, this whole line is in complete upheaval. You're talking about what? what one player that they came into this season that thinking he was going to be a starter, right? And that is Andrew Thomas. You mentioned the great PFF grade uh, coming out of this game alone. He now on the season, 264 snaps, 71.9 overall grade, just two penalties and no sacks allowed in this game. 
I'll forget the down and distance. I'm pretty sure that it was on the play where Daniel Jones finds Kenny Galladay to get him up on that sideline inside the five after the little scissor wrap between he and Kadarius Tony. Andrew Thomas one on one against Cameron Jordan kept in, kept himself in front of him, pushed him back, and protected that pocket for Daniel Jones. This is again, and I've said it a couple of times now, I think it's important. I am going to try to stay singularly focused on what we've discussed from the start of the season and, and really our general sentiment around this team. You have, you have to give time, right? You have to stay the course. Andrew Thomas looked better at the end of last year than he did at the start of his rookie season. He looked a little shaky in training camp and in preseason, but since he stepped on the field in meaningful games, he's been consistent. He's reduce those errors and penalties and he looks like a guy that maybe is never going to be the most athletic left and left tackle in the league but guess what he's going to protect daniel jones he's going to keep those bodies off of him and allow him to be successful in the passing game i i listen we talked about it before with dave gettleman man like all of a sudden now <laughs> you know we've always believed in daniel jones are we going to throw in now the left tackle like where are we headed with with the boxes that we wanted to see get checked and Yesterday's game and, and other games this season, really for those two players specifically, have been very proof positive samples. Listen, at the end of the day, Adam, there's we could very easily be two and two. We yeah. could be three and one, but yeah. let's throw that over 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 the shoulder. It, you know, what's the point in talking about it? Going into the season, we probably looked at this first four game stretch and said, if we finish two and two, we'll, we'll, we'll feel pretty good about where we're at. We're one and three. We're, we're a game behind where we need to be. But as we mentioned, you're seeing more encouraging things. This is no longer week one against Denver. You're seeing the progression. And we crushed, and I personally crushed, Jason Garrett for how ultra conservative his play calling was and how it, it felt like he was so out of touch with, with reality and what the team was doing. I have to give him credit because Jason Garrett called a great game for the Giants. And, you know, you say great game. Well, they had 10 points to go, you know, 10, 10 points with with seven or eight minutes to go. But he was calling the right place. He yep. went vertically with John Ross. They got Saquon out on, on that wheel route. And, and Saquon came back to the huddle because they had run it earlier in the game. It was like, he's he's jumping that early route. If we, if we do the wheel route, I've got this thing cooked. Jason Garrett listened and they called that play again. You look at Daniel Jones going down the field to Kenny Galladay. You look at Kadarius Tony finally getting more than one or two touches in a game. They're like, let's get this guy the ball because cool, like amazing things can happen. All across the field, Jason Garrett started identifying that, like, wow, these are the things that all my players do really well. Like John Ross, you're a speedster. Kadarius Tony, want to get it in your hands. Kenny Galladay, get us that tough third down. Saquon, if we can get you out in space, we'd love, we'd love to be able to have you make plays. Jason Garrett called a great game, and you know what? Like, I, I'm glad to be saying that because if he if he didn't, and we're shrugging our head again, and we're zero and four, we're wondering what what we're doing here. Yeah, and listen, I, I you know the, the one thing we didn't mention about Daniel Jones was he looks very much in command of the offense, setting people up at the line of scrimmage, right, checking in and out of plays. There's a different level of confidence to him this year than last year. His first year in Jason Garrett's offense versus the second year, right? Like, I think there is that progressive piece to it. And as much as uh, maybe you a little bit more than me, but I, I've been there, right? I've been trying to hedge against it a little bit, maybe for this sample of saying. As it works and as it progresses, we'll get a real sense of what Jason Garrett wants this offense to look like, especially with the moves they made in the offseason and how they want to run it. Um, And last tip of the cap to Saquon Barkley, too. He pounded that touchdown run in up the middle to win the game in overtime. You could see how much that meant to him. You could see how excited he was on the touchdown pass at the sideline. Like, you know, and he's been saying it. I want to get there. I want to be Saquon Barkley when they've asked him, can you ever get back to it? Like, I hope so. And this was the first time you got to see it. So when all the weapons are starting to fire, still guys were missing with injuries here. You can see how dynamic this offense can be. So listen, it's win number one, obviously. Turn right back around. Got to go to Dallas. And, and this is the hard part about starting 0-3. Every game becomes really big until you get yourself back to a point. We'll see what the Giants are able to accomplish as we look ahead to that one. We'll talk about injury updates. We'll talk about takeaways from the players later in this week. Obviously, you can follow us on YouTube. You can check us out wherever you subscribe to the podcast on social media, One Giant Podcast. If I could, though, leave you with this, Andy. Pain heals, chicks dig scars. Glory lasts forever. Name that quarterback. 
Ooh, I, I don't know, Adam. You got me stumped on this one. Shane Falco. A replacement, <laughs> my friend. Come on. John Wick go. legend. Matrix 4 alum. This guy gets it done. It's Keanu Reeves. We will be back talking all things New York football giants. Until then, though, as Andy Makowitz wants, needs, and today, after a win more than ever, demands the people know. As always, let's go Big Blue.